share how you got to this attorney that protected you because you you inherited the I inherited that Howard's had. lawyers uh, a firm called Kaplan and Drysdale a hugely respected law firm uh, one of the guys who runs it is also a former commissioner um, Howard was probably very wise to go to them when he first got hit with his audit and knew it might be bad because they were they were specialists in criminal tax fraud and there's always a, a possibility you might get indicted but um, they couldn't change gears they didn't know how to look at me and not see him so I needed to get different lawyers I needed to get lawyers who actually believed in me and were representing me and weren't carrying the baggage of Howard when the uh, IRS agent got done with her whole investigation she delivered a report it was about this thick and to me it was just pornography it was an examination of our lives over the last five years and it painted me as just a spendthrift, airhead, dilettante. I mean, I, I, I read like I was in one of those tabloids about starlets that I just sat by my pool eating chocolates, drinking champagne, on yachts, on jets, household staff around me in every direction because that's how she saw me. That's not how I saw myself, but that's how the federal government saw me. It's also how they would have painted me had I gone to trial. I would have had a defense, but you got to always, I've learned over the last 13 years to be very open to looking at yourself the way others see you. So I go to one friend who I thought I would let read this, who I felt was, um, had the integrity, was like a lockbox of secrets and facts. And that was a, a dear friend from reporting, Bob Woodward of the Washington Post. Bob and I had gone way, way back covering the anti-war movement together, just being on the street together, dodging tear gas together. His wife Elsa was a friend. They'd been to our house to dinner. Uh, they'd been to Nathan's with us for dinner. So I called up Bob and I said, I need you to look at this thing. This thing is happening to me and I need you to read this thing and, and tell me, because I can't read it. I've read some of it, and I'm just, I'm like, ah! So Bob read it. He was very cool. He said, do you mind if I send it over to Sheldon Cohen? He was my tax lawyer when the Nixon administration audited me and Carl, my, his partner, Carl Bernstein, and uh, I'd like to have Sheldon take a look. He sent it to Sheldon, and then Sheldon said for me to call him in two weeks, and that's what I did. I went in, and my new mode and uh, <laughs> my moo -moo and, and uh, my shell necklace my and, pasta shell necklace and uh, Sheldon and his partner Miriam and she was just like a firecracker she was just amazing uh, she was just young and full of energy and uh, but they both because 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 Sheldon was like a, a grandfather and she was like my niece but um, he said in this great lawyerly term he said I think you have a colorable argument for innocent spouse and I ought to know I wrote, wrote the code Could you, so, and I, I burst want you into think tears. About that. I mean <laughs> that was so profound the, the good for all of this horrible bad fortune this one moment that you were friend with Bob Woodward who was being audited by the IRS under the direction of President Nixon because you busted him for Watergate and that you said I cannot read this and that you shared it with him and he said I want to send you to my friend who's an attorney who wrote the innocent spouse and, code. Yeah, and I don't even know that Bob knew that Sheldon had written the code. I mean, who knew about innocent spouse? I mean, I, I had never heard the term until I went into that lawyer's office the first time because actually Sh uh, Bob and Elsa thought I should go to trial. And I mentioned that because Elsa was like, you're a woman, think how many uh, widowed women, widows there are in D.C. If ha even half of them are in the jury, they'll be on your side. And I thought, and I already had read part of this report, and I knew how the IRS would portray me. And I would have a hard time in the eyes of a D.C. jury looking like I didn't live a damn good life. And um, I, uh, I mentioned this to Sheldon, and he said, Bob's smart about a lot of things, but that's why he has me for a tax lawyer. He said, you'd never last a day in court and I sensed that and I was fine with that I didn't want to go to court I I wanted I wanted to do it all you know out of court which is which is what we did I mean I never had to I mean I had to build a defense a defense had to be presented but it I never had to go into a courtroom so you know with all the bad luck you had extraordinary luck too I mean this story is about horrible horrible luck and it 
and beneficent moments and, and and fortune but great yeah. fortune that came your way and now you're sharing this story yeah. and great fortune you're... that came my way by always screaming help right but there was the estate money which which you paid had, the lawyer which paid the lawyer i mean you could have been thrown to the wolf so it can always be oh i couldn't have afforded i could if if i well if i had had to pay it with just what i was left i never it would have cleaned me out i mean now that i mentioned getting cleaned out so in this whole thing of, of, of dealing with the IRS, an innocent spouse, it captures all my focus. Meanwhile, I'm the accidental saloon owner. I'm Lois Lane, who's had to become Miss Kitty with no skill set. I not only had never worked in a restaurant in my life, but I walked in Nathan's and it just looked like the Wild West to me because it was a saloon it was open every day of the week, every day of the year, until the wee hours of the morning. It was just a bunch of guys. The staff was a boys club. And here comes wife of, almost 50 years old, doesn't even do shots. You know, <laughs> When she comes in, she sits in the back room. She didn't know practically anybody's name. I knew the name of maybe two of the staff. And um, I'm stuck with this place. I've got to run it. I can't, I can't give it away. I can't say, no, I don't want to deal with this because I actually own it. If the staff come in and steal everything off the walls, it's my problem. I can't ignore it. You know, and that happens to more women than you will believe. And, and I know because I stepped in to take over for my brother, that is the other parallel that's going on in your life. And if you think that's not tough, number one, you walk in to take over a family member's business, when you've been outside and you come in, there's not a great big party and love fest going on. There's also no tutorial. You the there's no tutorial. There's nobody to do it. Fortunately, my brother died. We spoke every single day. I had an IT background. I knew the deals that he was working yeah, on. I well, knew his life. I had that. All I knew I about restaurants in. was using a knife and fork and ordering off the menu. Well, yeah, so I had a little bit of a leg up, but still I inherited partners who were not enamored to have me there, who went out of their way to make sure I was not happy, yeah. that they were trying, they try to drive you almost out the door. They really want you to go. Oh, they, they, want, they want, oh, there is no question that the boys club wanted to see that my tail go between my legs and skitter away. And oh, I wanted to so badly. But I had to take them on. I had a manager who was working behind my back. I had bartenders who were trying to tell me what to do. Finally, one day, I fired one of the bartenders. And that was like you know throwing down the gauntlet. And then I started imposing uh, cutbacks and, um, and, and procedures, real business-like procedures, because Nathan's could not continue to run like the fun house it was. And I came in one day, and somebody told me that there was all kinds of um, evidence of rats all over the place I, in I the building. I couldn't believe that when I read that. Well, Nathan's is a 100-year-old building. The, the, the rats at in that building. In Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., and, and every building in Georgetown. The rats think we are the, are the predators. They think they have ownership to those buildings. So all you can do is, you know, you find every little hole that they come in, and, and you put up rats, rat wire, rat wire everywhere. Nathan's was just down in the basement, was just and, full and of rat wire. And if you're not wire. familiar with Washington, D.C., rats can be as big as cats. Oh, Dogs. bigger. I mean, yeah. Bigger. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so I come in, and there's all this evidence of rats. And, uh, and then the manager says to me, well, somebody cut the rat screens. And I, and I was, like, freaking out because I'm sitting down in the office, and, and, and I just the thought that down at my feet level, a rat could come, uh, could come zooming out start nibbling on my toes. And, um, and also, you know, the health department comes in at random times. If they'd seen what we were seeing, they would have shut us down and that would have jeopardized everybody's jobs. Well, Arnaldo, the day chef, very polite, proud El Salvadoran man, worked very hard, um, just was always sort of uh, deferential to me, but worked, I knew, he was, I knew he was on my side. I didn't ever have a problem with the kitchen staff. Arnaldo asked if he could see me, and we went outside on the back steps on Wisconsin Avenue, and he said, Mrs. Joint, um, I know why this is happening. It was some of the young men, and he was referring to the young dishwashers. And um, he said, but it's fixed now, and it's not going to happen again. And I said, but why would they do this, Arnaldo? And he said, well, they don't like, they don't like some of the, the new procedures you've, uh, you've you know, started. They don't like the cutback in overtime. And I said, well, what, but 
I said, but, but what they're doing could cost them their jobs. You know, what? where's the sense in jeopardizing the whole business? And that, I think that's very common, though. People have anger, and, and I, I think that's a human behavior, and it's an unfortunate one. I want to ask you a question, because I want to open this up. I know a lot mm -hmm. of people have questions. I want to ask you, what prompted you to share your story? I mean, I think for a lot of people, you know, we, you know, we have this, we, we want to project this, this image of success and accomplishment, and that we've got our act together, and we do these things. And it's hard to share these very challenging things, the man you love, your life, to mm -hmm. put this out there. What, what prompted you to do that? What made you want to go public with the story? Well, I was probably always writing it. Um, when my career sort of hit the rocks as a journalist and I had to just do Nathan's, um, I missed writing. I missed, I missed what I knew how to do. And I would just keep a journal at home of things that were going down. And I, I, early on, I tried a narrative form of it to see if it might be a book because my shrink, who was getting me through so much, said, you have no idea how many women go through this and they'd probably benefit from your story. And I thought, okay. But nobody was interested, interested in it then. They didn't think it was a book. And they were right. It needed, I needed to go through so much more crap <laughs> before it was a book. Uh, it, took, it, took another, it took another eight years to become... Th this book, and um, I'm glad it didn't happen till it happened. But I suppose once a storyteller, always a storyteller. And maybe I'd always been telling everybody else's story, but this I knew this was a compelling story. And they always tell you about writing to write what you know, and this is what I know. And I found over these last two years of writing it with Nathan's closed and everything moving into the background, that it was a wonderful way to review and to shed, purge, whatever, resolve, give forgiveness, all those things, to just get to a very good place. So in, in so many levels, it was meant to be. Because I, I thought that was so brave. I mean, you know, I always think I about, <laughs> I think it's brave. I think it's really brave. And I think it's generous of you to share your heart and your experience. I mean. For a lot of women, you know, it's like, for women, I think especially, it's like, because you feel like we own the responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask my man. I didn't ask my husband. I didn't pay attention. I didn't ask the right question. I signed the forms. And we all do it. We all do it. I mean, I, there's no woman who, who, you know, I think we all right, have but or will be in that situation in some way. Also, I was raising a little boy all by myself, and he was number one. In, in, in any situation, um, his consideration came first. And um, I wanted to be able to tell him the story of what happened to us. And I always do better writing than talking. So I, you know, th there was always that need to have the story there for him. Because I was always telling him things at an age appropriate time. But um, and he has read it, and he likes it. He likes it. Yeah. That's good. So Nathan's closed down now. Mm -hmm. um, which is, I got which my is, freedom. July 2009, I called it my Independence Day when my, by then, pro bono lawyers um, got my noose out of the neck that was a personal guarantee I signed. 